Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're at the Business Society 2045 Friday Talks. Uh, we interview people worldwide seeking to create a better future through social movement and thought leadership. Uh, we aim to bring together social movements from across various disciplines to help co-create a broader and more cohesive vision for the year 2045. We have a collective vision of what it could be, but we want to hear yours. We can create a, a robust voice for change by bringing together adjacent movements and thought leaders. With that, why don't we switch to Tina and uh, ask Tina to introduce herself. Thank you, Matt. So yeah, so I'm Tina, I'm based in Amsterdam, uh, grew up in Germany and I've been living in different places like South Africa, Hungary, and also planning on living in Brazil a little bit more. <laughs> but um, I mean, obviously all, all these kind of um, experience ha experiences have shaped my view on life and um, had me very early explore the topic of purpose. <laughs> so I'm a, I would also say I'm probably a typical millennial, generation Y, um, and I've always been on the seek for freedom in, in that sense, in everything what I did was at traveling, school, studies, and um, maybe a little bit uh, contradictive, but I have a business administration background, <laughs> and I questioned the whole thing, especially the, um, the part about uh, purpose equals profit. And, um, and then I got in touch with different kind of movements. I also, um, I got in touch with different kind of industries. I ended up working in an organization in the Netherlands in oil and gas. And um, there we implemented a radical purpose approach. We also worked self-managed with holacracy. Um, and then we made personal development first priority and finally radically implemented purpose. And what I mean with that is purpose was literally the center point of everything what we did, everything. Like um, the salary system, hiring, firing, um, strategy, everything. That was a very interesting journey. Uh, it was a five year long journey for me until I decided to leave last summer and have been since um, focusing on projects I have been involved before that are around emotional intelligence, organizational development, and um, yeah, creating resilient and adaptive cultures. So yeah, I live in Amsterdam, I said that. Oh yeah, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe also good to know, um, 13 weeks now. And um, yeah, I've been in a relationship with a Dutch guy for 10 and a half years. His name is Bart. And um, we also, we have a camper van that we remodeled ourselves. And yeah, I think that's it so far from my side. So what's next? Uh, besides being pregnant and having babies and all that stuff. <laughs> uh, What's next for you? I know you were in the fashion space and clothing. And so what, what are you doing? Yeah, so um, so indeed, also during that time, I, um, uh, I founded a clothing label with the purpose of, um, or the intention to create a fully sustainable um, clothing label, whatever that means, right? Sustainability in, in fashion, very um, sensitive topic. Um, and out of that, a production company um, actually was created and founded in Istanbul, which is still running. So we stopped with the clothing label, but we continued with the production company. And um, But I pulled myself back of that. So my friends in Istanbul are doing that. So I'm just going there as a friend and practically helping. Um, yeah, that's it. But what I'm doing now is my focus is now on an app that I've developed with friends in Brazil. Um, to make emotional intelligence like more visible and tangible and accessible in organizations to create more emotionally safe cultures to that boost obviously co-creation and collaboration and also um, helping organizations to create more sustainable cultures and around that we work with design experiences and emotion how can we bring that into different institutions like education, but also in real estate and, um, and so forth. So these are my, my main topics at this point. I'll, I'll go straight for the, <clears throat> for the question, which is the year 2045. Now I imagine we may or may, have, may not have flying cars by then, um, <laughs> but it's going to be different. We know it's going to be very different. 
and uh, either different, that is totally dystopian. Is you know we're like the worst movie uh, that you've ever seen, or or it'll be different in a more positive way. So of all the things that you're doing, if if they're super successful and and really take off and all that, um, what would that year? What would that time look like? You, you you got off your your flying car in front of your house, and what does the world look like? in that uh, given your your vision and where you're going that we're talking about like in 23 years right <laughs> so <laughs> flying cars i don't think not just yet maybe maybe uh in california obviously but um so how i imagine it is when i when i think out of my perspective now that we are more integrated and more inclusive in terms of I, I speak now of the organizational space, right? So um, that we live diversity of needs, diversity of, of um, characters, people, um, cultures in a very different way. And um, I think also this is actually pretty realistic, to be honest. So the work we are doing right now, bringing more emotional intelligence into organization creates more emotional awareness, creates more the ability to actually manage own emotions and that is also impacting relationships and co-creation and collaboration. And what we also see in that movement is to work more decentralized. And there is like really interesting initiatives going on in different kinds of systems as well. And in the, in the workspace, I think we will really get to a point where we have this more established and have it more like a normal. And I also think this is happening because it is also to a certain extent a natural involvement. When I see now Generation Y, um, it feels like we're kind of like bridging generations. Okay, probably every generation is bridging generations, but, <laughs> but um, I mean, we're going from like, if I think about my parents, they had a very different value system and different, different kind of ambitions in their life to us now being this, okay, self-actualization and freedom seeking people. But if we look now at generation C, which is everybody born between like 1995 and I think 2010, um, they have this very natural ability to, to live inclusion and diversity. They, they live diversity. So um, there's also, there was interesting, uh, interesting report out there the other day because in Brazil already 20% of the population is Generation Z. And, and that brings hope because if we think about a natural way to live inclusion and integration and we bring that into the organizational context but also in the context of our society with that, I think we have a huge catalyzer and a huge tool to uh, to bring change and transformation in the context of evolution because it's just happening so i would go in that direction that we have more integrated cultures we live more inclusion and diversity which is having positive impact on creativity innovation collaboration co-creation that's beautiful um <laughs> And, and, and by the way, 23 years is, is, is not that short. I mean, think about of what you were like 23 years ago and how much the world has changed <laughs> in 23 years. Yeah. Not for the better, okay? It's gotten, it's gotten better in, certain sense, in a certain sense, but it's gotten a lot worse in terms of, you know, Amazon becoming what it is today. And, and uh, Musk uh, and, and those people. So it's gotten worse in, in a very short time frame because of a system behind it. So uh, I, I have hopes that I'll get to see some of it. Um, so um, the, the talk about decentralization. So what, I mean, normally when I say decentralization to people um, and it dawns on them, talk, I'm talking about uh, doing away with the hierarchy, they panic and say, no, 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 that, that would be total chaos. What would you say to that? Well, I mean, this is how we met, obviously. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, so the way I got in touch with this 
concept of decentralization is also in the organizational context. So I got in touch with self-management, um, in our case, holacracy, and it can really work, but it does need other variables to make it work, right? So how I bring that into the context of my work now is um, as more emotionally aware we are and as more as we can increase our levels of self-awareness and also to a certain extent self-love, I do believe we can be more self-accountable. And, um, and that boosts systems like self-management or systems that actually like support decentralization. So I do think this is happening. Um, and I do think that it can really work because there's also, there's a, a natural kind of component to it to make it work. Um, I mean, maybe an, an easy example, uh, and probably you have, you've heard it a couple of times, but how I got also to this topic, I was part of an organization um, which was very hierarchical and it was a very small organization, 120 people, but steep hierarchies and extreme power relationships. And I couldn't believe my eyes how people would give away their responsibility between nine and five then go home and make the big decisions like you know, bringing babies into the world, buying houses, traveling the world, all that, which is happening. And it is just flowing, right? So if we look at organization as a living organism, um, because it simply consists of people, I think we are, we are able to create an environment where this kind of decentralization can actually work and can also to a certain extent create a frictionless, maybe it doesn't have to be frictionless even because friction can also be very good and tension obviously to, to develop further, but to create a level of collaboration that brings us more creativity and innovation. So yeah, I think we get there, <laughs> but also I think we get there in 23 years, however, um, maybe not everybody, obviously, at the same time, but I do think a majority will get there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm also counting on on the uh, what you said before about generation in the letter uh, being more open. We're more open to um, the the race issue is becoming more uh, diffused, I guess. Um, it, but in some places, not in, not in every place. Uh, one thing that I found out, I suspected, but I found out the hard way is uh, commercials in California show a lot of biracial couples, same-sex couples, all, all of that, right? But the same commercials don't show that up in, the, in some of the Southern states. So ah. the, the TV is, is aimed at different cultures, I guess, and, uh, you know, in the deep part of Texas, they don't, they don't show it, but in Dallas, they will. So it's, it's kind of weird that way. Not weird, it's, it's to be expected, but it does affect us. So I'm, I'm counting on that. I'm counting on, on people just, like you said, they're making big decisions at home. Why shouldn't they make big decisions at work? And why should they be infantilized at work when they're adults? So that's what I'm counting on. Um, about to hit the uh, 20 minute mark. And um, Jose, do you have any questions do you wanna ask? Yeah, I'd like to, um, because Tina, you, you speak of um, emotional intelligence and purpose and, and this distributed model of working. And for me, the, they're, they're one and the same, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they point to the same thing. So when we are um, in your vision of, of the work that you're doing and, and the experience that you've had, when we're talking about how do we align in order to work together, because that's really what's missing, right? In the traditional world, alignment comes by the organizational edict, a fiat idea, right? Where you're going to all do this and that's what we need to do. And everybody has to sort of follow the, the rules. Um, how do we do that in a distributed environment? And obviously you've had some experience with um, purpose as being that alignment tool. And it sounds like you're coming to the realization that purpose 
may or may not be the, the right tool for an organization to align around, but no matter what, people need to have emotional intelligence. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that what I've picked up? Yes. Um, so how, how I would explain it today is, so I have to say purpose was for me always this kind of direction and always like the thing we need to focus on as an organization and as individuals. And we, I mean, we pushed it to an extent where we really tried to align personal purpose to organization's purpose. Um, I don't think it works like this. Um, I, I do think it's a part of it, as you say. However, what I found out now is, I mean, generally, I, I really believe in an integrated approach, right? That we have everything in there and then we can also really live this kind of whole system in balance. Um, but to start out with, this balance also starts to a certain extent of our, uh, in ourselves, right? So emotional intelligence and happiness goes together, happiness in the sense of that we feel a certain stability inside. That for example, I have, I have a good example here. So yesterday morning, we woke up on this side of the world. I mean, also in, this, in the States, obviously, but it's very close to, to here. Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, that was huge. I mean, I've been to Kiev, I've been to Chernobyl, and you know, we know some people. And so I was... I haven't slept really well the past two nights. And I mean, I'm working with emotions, right? So it's like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Okay, I'm pregnant. I'm, I'm dreaming more vividly and such. But then today I had a meeting with my team in Brazil and they gave me a very different perspective on things. They said, yeah, this is happening there. And at the same time, you're looking around what has changed. So what is happening there is not defining your moment. And that is, that is very true. I can still, you know, like show so solidarity and be there to a certain extent, but at the same time have boundaries to stay stable. And when I do that and I feel like centered and aligned and have the sense of self, I can create and act out of more empowerment. Well, empowerment is a result in that, but I can act more out of intention, out of purpose, out of direction and out of inspiration as well. So. I think this is where the key lies because that helps us also to manage our own emotions and to bring that into authenticity and really strong relationships. So it does go all together, obviously, you know, because it comes from us. And at the same time, the space we create together can also help us to stabilize. Like, I mean, that's a choice that I'm working with these guys in Brazil. And they, you know, they helped me stabilize today, you know, to, in just giving me a different perspective and I was open for it, helped me to be empowered again and to create out of that energy and make this event inspire, inspire me and also value my work. And that is so important at this point, right? So, but it does go all together. And I would also add probably passion and values and uh, yeah. So your experience with purpose at the organizational level you said it doesn't work that way um so what, what does that mean it doesn't work that yes. way i mean uh, we've had a lot of conversations about personal purpose right mm -hmm. um what we call radical purpose a purpose that comes from within me um but an organizational purpose that's different right what what what's your expression of that so on the one side, obviously, a purpose can, can be very inspiring, motivating, giving direction for an organization. I really believe so. At the same time, there's a fine line. Like if you live purpose that radically what we did to make it part, re really a center part of everything what we did, there is a fine line that it actually like also intervenes in your identity to a certain extent, because you start identifying yourself with purpose out of the sudden personal needs are getting secondary in a sense because you do it for the purpose right so that's great so I do it and at the same time an organizational purpose is often also very abstract like it's not always that kind of tangible um, so it leaves interpretation for everybody involved so you also have a risk of not speaking the same language anymore which is a thing because if you are not communicating anymore how are, how are you co-creating and collaborating and what kind of impact is that having then on your 
creativity, on your efficiency, productivity, and the organization in the end. And, and do you think we find a way to, to understand what that means and still <laughs> use purpose at the organizational level? Or do we move to something different than purpose on the organizational level? And I say that as I'm looking at Andy uh, with his business on purpose in the background there. So, uh, and, and, and I know that a lot of us think uh, a lot about what that means. I think it's a matter of the level of integration. So I do think purpose is important and I do think it's part of the system and not the thing, you know, it's not the star kind of like being brighter than anything else. And I think if we look at every part of the organization also in our, in our society like that, um, that we can integrate better and we can actually live inclusion on a deeper level. And that is, you know, we, talk, we talked about needs a lot as well. We as individuals, we have needs, you know, needs trigger emotions. So we have these different kinds of needs. An organization has needs to survive, to make impact, to whatever. So aligning these um, in that system, um, I think that's where, where the magic is, you know? So not like, okay, we decide now for the one again and we ditch the other. I don't think this is how the world works. We have enough, you know, of these islands and, you know, isolation that we are creating, but we need to have a dialogue with all these variables in it. And I think we get that in integrating these individual needs. And, um, and I think that happened, you know, it, it functions the same in a supply chain. We had that in Turkey, um, like, okay, usually you have like, okay, the, the, um, we, need, we need fabric now. So you, so you talk to the fabric supplier, very isolated process. Then you talk to the yarn supplier. But if you integrate all these in one process, you open the dialogue of needs again. And I think it happens exactly the same way on just an organizational level with these different kind of components. I like that. I like, I like that idea of wholeness. I mean, that's sort of essentially what you're, what you're saying is, is what I believe uh, Frederick Ballou described, uh, this idea of wholeness, that we're bringing it all together. We're not simply playing uh, loose roles and loose um, disconnected relationships between things. Um, the, do you think, I, I'm just going to ask this last question and maybe we can open it up to everybody else, but uh, do you think your generation has more of a, of a, of that wholeness vibe in general? Um, because we're, you know, we're a bunch of old guys here, right? Um, and, and for me, at least my generation was made up of figuring out ways to stand out and to be your own individual and your own organization and to found things and to create things and to, to be that person. Um, and we didn't know how to do it together very well, I don't think. And I wonder if you think your generation has a better sense of how to do it together. I think that's what I meant with kind of like the generation Y is bridging now between, um, yeah, the, the, the generation also of my parents and the generation C, because I do think a lot of people um, entered, for example, into the workforce in my age with this crazy idea of we need to be successful, we need to make a lot of money, we need to be famous. And it's a very individual kind of um, few. However, what I've seen is a trend also that people are burning out um, uh, so much earlier. Like I've seen people burning out in their, in their early 20s, even before their 20s, um, and in my age now also. So I'm, I'm 33. And, um, and you know, getting a perspective change of what is really important and what is really important. And then the one thing is coming up, relationships, because relationships keep us happy and healthy. And obviously COVID brought, pushed a lot of things to the surface in terms of where things are not going great um, in terms of structures and politics and other systems, but also internal structures. So what is really important to me and how do I want to live my life? 
So the purpose question comes up because purpose is also a very trendy word now, you know, you see it everywhere, but people also understand, oh, it feels better when I do things together and it feels better. So I think this idea of trying things out is, um, is very widespread right now. So I do, I do see the change of mindset, the change of perspective, and also the change of choosing where they want to work and what they want to do. And um, so I think there is, there is definitely a pattern and a change going on and it's very fast. I mean, COVID accelerated it, um, but there is more the sense of collaboration and co-creation, I would say now. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so 33 with the baby uh, yeah. on the way. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I, I want to open it up now to, uh, to the rest of the community here, people watching and stuff like that. Um, so if you have any questions, please go ahead. If not, I've got a couple that I, I'll ask myself. I have a question. Um, you mentioned an app that you're that you're working on or that you've developed about emotional intelligence, and I'm really I, a lot of my work is around developing emotional intelligence in teams. And um, there's something about um, emotional intelligence as a maturation phase where you actually are able to set aside your ego and work for the good of a larger, you know, whether it's your team, your organization, your community, whatever. So I'm really curious, how does your app tie into that? Do you see that it actually does help people to move along that uh, maturation spectrum to become a little more developed? Yeah, so I mean, our app is is practically created for for also pretty big organizations, right? And also for people that might not yet be um, that comfortable to be in touch with emotions. That's why it's an app, you know, it makes it easier. It's very playful. There's 100% confidentiality. So but in principle, it starts with, okay, what are my triggers? What what is actually um, triggering emotions in me? And we made it very simple. We based it on the five primary emotions um, of sadness, anger, fear, um, aversion, and happiness. And then also how to deal with them. How is it showing up in my body? What can I do with it? So the second part would be, yeah, how to manage these emotions. And finally, how can I bring them like positively into the collective as a result? So it's like a, a three-step process in that sense. And um, it is, I think the biggest part of it is creating the awareness first, uh, and then also creating the awareness in leaders and HR. So if like 30% of a team feels a certain way, then um, HR or the leader would, would get a notification to say, hey, if you don't do anything, you know, this, this kind of emotion, it's contagious, you know, it can impact your entire team. But here you have a facilitation plan, you can do this to, um, to manage this emotion. And having people in touch with that topic is already creating also more interaction, because then you are actually you are seeing the other person also out of a perspective, with more compassion and empathy, because you have been in touch with this yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if I can follow up on that, um, I was just in New York working with a uh, company that's in the fashion industry. Um, and I'm working with these senior leaders. They're all in their in their 40s, uh, late 30s, early 40s. And we were doing this thing around, you know, where does your purpose line up with the company's purpose? And I was really amazed to hear them say, you know, I don't know that I know what my purpose is. So we had a really interesting in-depth conversation of that's actually really good to bring that up. Let's talk about that, you know? And after we went through and I honored every one of them for saying, I don't know what my purpose is. And I said, well, you know, your purpose right now is you have a job that is allowing you to pay your mortgage and raise your children. So that's fitting with your life purpose. So when you consider that maybe this isn't your entire career path, you know, you might be somewhere else in 10 years. Um, how does it feel to align what you sense your life goals and purpose are with where you are right now? And then they got into this really interesting conversation. I'm wondering what kind of things you're seeing when it comes to melding organizational purpose with personal purpose and having that gray area where people get to say, I don't really know. And how do I, you know, how can I tell you what my purpose is and how it lies to the organizational purpose? I don't know what it is. So how is that playing out in your world? Yeah, it's a 
That's a good question. Um, so I also have to say, like in our organization where we practiced it, um, we did it. We did. Ev we took everything very seriously. <laughs> so everything, and also this purpose part. So this purpose part actually came out of the personal development um, phase, where we all had our individual coach, and then at some point we got to this point of, okay, why am I actually here for? Why, why do I get up in the morning? You know, why do I commute to the office? So these questions were, were there and a lot of people had a sense of purpose but couldn't put words to it, right? Mm -hmm. Me included, like I knew I was pulled by something but I couldn't really put words to it. So when we went on this discovery journey um, as a group but very individual in that group, we celebrated every step in it, right? So um, every little discovery was celebrated and that was extremely impactful. So every word you put to the purpose was, was a celebration. And then a logical consequence was, but what is, the, what is the purpose of our organization? Does it still align? But the space was so safe that people really you know, expressed that and said, okay, but what is that? Do I really fit here still? So we went on this kind of discovery journey and, um, and everybody was like, huh, okay. You know, these purposes were very, very different. Like, you know, I figured out my purpose is to break down boundaries to connect the world. And okay, I did communication and brand building. So that fits, you know, and I can live that purpose in, a, in an organization in oil and gas where the purpose is transforming this industry from the inside out but I can also live that somewhere else and it gives me a sense of meaning. So, yeah, I think um, that was a really powerful process until the point when it just like got too extreme, you know, when, when we just like whew, <laughs> went into a different direction, but um, it was, it was a very valuable um, time and to find that out and to celebrate that together and experience that together. The interesting conversation. I actually, I actually just accepted a, a request from the American Management Association to teach a three-day course on emotional intelligence in Houston in a few weeks. Most of the people are from a chemical company. Oh, wow. So I, I view these as my great opportunity to do transformational work. The, the, the question I have um, is... When I think about generations, and Matt alluded to this before, you know, when he said 2045, we might be living in a dystopian landscape, which, which is possible. When I think, if I, was, if I was in my 30s today, certain days I'd say to myself, oh, why bother? I, I just want to go back to sleep. This is given, given the status of organizations, given climate, and I, I know people are aware, but how do, you, how do you guys think about this? I know it's hard, to, it's hard to speak for a whole generation, but do the best you can. Yeah, this is, uh, this is incredible. I, I talked about that with friends today. Uh, and um, so obviously you meet people that, are, um, that feel very hopeless very hopeless they I know people they would not even put kids in the world right now because they say there's no hope but it, on the other side there are people that are very hopeful right and um, and they are creating out of this energy and in my surrounding there are more more hopeful people than uh, than hopeless people and and all across the globe like I have a friend in in Kashmir India who lives in an area that is extremely troubled obviously and he is the most kind of like Zen person I know. Like <laughs> he, would, he would talk to me and within five minutes, I'm like, whoa, okay. The most positive and always finding opportunities in everything he does. He's a natural entrepreneur. He's like building up this business and that. He produces Kashmir, you know, and now he's also opening a restaurant. So I would say in general, or the majority, um, I would say is in this, in this, yeah, let's say wave of, I want to create something that is changing our world, that is changing our world to positive and, um, and fueling transformation. And also a lot more people are getting in touch with um, these topics of increasing self-awareness and, you know, working with their own potential. And that is, I think, also giving a lot of hope because on the other side, it is always, it is a choice, right? If we are being hopeful or not. 
And if we're being hopeful, then it also shapes our experiences, like everything what we do. And, um, and I see this happening a lot in this generation Y. Beautiful. I mean, my, my only follow-up comment would be, um, <laughs> you can lead from any place in an organization. And so, you know, yeah. kind of <laughs> say, lead from every place with that, that kind of thinking. It's just so important to bring that energy uh, into organizations. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 I, I now fully understand why this old saying, youth is wasted on the young, um, <laughs> is, is said. <laughs> <laughs> That was said like, by an old man, right? <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> it's funny. While you guys were talking, it occurred to me that um, one of you guys said, uh, what is it? Um, it's a choice. And it's not always a choice. If you're in the depth of um, depression or something yeah. like that, you can have a bunch of choices. The world very different, right? Very, very dark. So uh, I think, so could it be that part of that is the absence of, not the absence of, but the sensitivity to trauma that our generation of old people, like Jose said, um, where that we just couldn't deal. We know that if we got too much in touch with our trauma, we would just not succeed, not be different, not be, not be rich and all that stuff. And, um, and what I noticed in my kids, which are your age, older actually, and uh, is that they're more sensitive to their trauma, you know, because my, my original reaction was, oh, ignore that, you know, go on with life. And, uh, and, their, and their reaction was, no, no, this is very real. This is affecting me. Um, so could be could that be part of what we're talking about here that younger generations more and more in touch with their trauma, which is important to be healthy. Yeah, it's a it's a good point. So um, I mean, as you know, like we also we have quite some experience with depression in in the family of my of my boyfriend. Like two of his uncles committed suicide. His mom tried to commit suicide. And, um, and we have been in touch with this topic a lot. And I think the patterns we have seen, and I also see it in my parents, is um, you don't talk about everything or a lot of things you just is positive and you're not necessarily getting in touch um, with emotions. It's like, as a kid, you naturally say to kids, don't cry, you know, don't cry. I mean, you mean it out of good intentions, but in the end, you, you know, you practically tell the kid to suppress emotions and then emotions are coming out later somewhere, you know, in the life. And, um, and I think that our generation, potentially, I see it more and more happening, is, is also asking for help more, you know? So I have my own coach since already, I don't know, three and a half years. And we're talking about so many different things. And also, obviously, we went through childhood trauma and, and all kinds of things in increasing also own self-awareness um, and such. So I do think it's not a taboo topic anymore, you know, because I mean, depression is out there, burnout's out there, 52% of employees are burning out. By 2030, depression is, is one of our leading sicknesses, illnesses in the world. Um, you cannot just, you know, put it aside anymore, because I think we've all been in touch with it to a certain extent with friends or family. And um, I think this line, this boundary is, um, this is, is just like getting smaller. So I think we're easier reaching out now, and also easy, easier opening up to friends. If the, if the way is too, um, too long to go to a coach or psychologist, we start talking more to the partner and friends about certain topics, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the ability to uh, be more, more vulnerable, you know, to put mm -hmm. yourself out there in ways that, to me, it's like, don't talk about that. You know, that, that, that will, 
somebody will hurt you based on that information. So don't talk about that. Um, that I noticed in my own case and, and, and the people that I work with, um, at, uh, that I work with, you know, they're very young. They're on average, I think is 26 or something. Um, and they say, thing, they say things that astound me. It's like, why well, I wouldn't, I would have never said that. Um, but the, the counter, the good thing about that is that they get a lot of help. People are also very willing to jump in and help and with technical stuff, but also with personal things. So um, I think we're heading in the right direction. I think mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are searching for the same kinds of things. And that's why I'm so hopeful that 23 years is, is a long time. Um, I mean, think of what you're going to be in 23 years. I'll be dead, but think of what you're going to be. Uh, Doug. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wanted to say um, your clarity and maturity and depth of awareness is sort of breathtaking <laughs> at, your, at your age. I mean, I, I slogged a lot of decades to get to where you are already. <laughs> um, <Thank you>. And <laughs> And yeah, and and... It's also heartening, assuming you're not the only one, like there are a lot of you, um, it's heartening to know that you guys are stepping into your power with that orientation. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. But see, again, it's about opening the dialogue, right? And I think this is what the world needs, because like this, we can break patterns and we can co-create. We are co-creating already, right? Bucky Fowler used to say, you must consider your children to be your elders in universe time because they have been cooking longer, waiting to come in. And I think you're a great example of that. I, I am meeting a lot of people, a generation or two younger than me, who have incredible awareness that I certainly lacked at that age. And I look at someone like Greta Thunberg, you know, that that girl is an elder in a young body, right? She's got mm -hmm. such incredible attunement to what's going on around her and an ability to speak to it. So uh, it's, it is a pleasure to see. I, I wanted to say, it feels related to trauma, this idea of learned helplessness. Um, you know, I was working with a, a group where I did the senior level managers and went to the next level down. And the first thing they told me was, if senior management's not on board, there's no point in doing it, nothing's gonna work. And then I showed them this video about above the line, below the line. I said, how many are above the line? Every, no one. They were all below the line. So I engaged them in a listening exercise and had them connect with their breath and their body and then listen to each other in a series of questions. It says, now, how many are above the line? And everyone went, I am really present. And I said, now, how many senior managers are in the room? None. So this idea of we outsource our agency to our bosses, our managers, our elected leaders. I think this is also something that that needs to be carefully examined and rejected of, you know, where do we have agency here? And what am I, what limits am I placing on myself unconsciously that if I would just peek a little bit around the corner, I might find, wow, I can make a move here that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot of that in what you're saying. Yeah. And also interesting to say, to comment on that quickly, because um, I've been in touch late. So I've, I've been pondering on this question, what happened the past, especially two years that we got in this organization to this radical purpose approach, right? And I came to this, okay, when purpose is overpowering, then we can really, we can, um, we can look at ego, but the healthy version of ego, right? The ego we need to live, like the, the sense of self ego. But if we have this unhealthy version, which can hijack the whole system like that, we are having, we're creating the illusion of separation. And this is what you say, because you talked a lot now about like you created this connection again, right? Amongst these people to, to get them on the uh, same boat. But, um, but in the end, like, I think this is what, what it is about because we live like majorly in a world of this illusion of separation. If we look at politics, if we look at, what is happening in the world, there's so much chaos, right? So starting with this inner connection and then, you know, also bringing that to the world, I think there's, yeah, 
there's so much power in it. Two things. One, uh, I just want to punctuate how clear you are at someone your age. It's beautiful to see. And, and the other thing was a correlate of, of trauma that's real present in the world today, something we all need to be careful with, the idea of, of people taking their trauma and making it their identity for their entire life. I'm not saying, you know, don't engage in causes, but the idea of having that be your entire identity, not a good thing. Not inspiring, not like you're not positively creating out of that energy, but it's more, yeah, like the opposite, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're talking about trauma. You heard that as making it part of your identity. You're, you're warning us of not making it part of our identity, yeah. um, which I also agree is, is, is a silly thing to do, to use a nice word. And, um, <laughs> but it's important. But because of that, we don't, we, I tend to shut my own trauma, you know, and ignore it completely until years, years later when it doesn't hurt me anymore. And, uh, and I think the ability that these folks have now, the younger folks, is the ability to look at it and talk about it and, and be vulnerable about it and be open about it. And that's very valuable. That's not making part of your end bad but it's a valuable thing that we shouldn't let go because it could lead to pathological conditions. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying, Matt. So thank you for saying it more clearly than I did. <laughs> but at I, the uh, same time, just because like at the same time, now I see, you know, we're all on social media, Instagram, Facebook. And now the event happened yesterday with Ukraine and everybody is like sharing, 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 sharing more, right? So I also see a lot of people like suffering with that. So it's still not that easy that you are experiencing this, but you are still like very centered and stable and can just say, okay, this is information that's coming in, but I, it can really inspire me to create, but it also can still, you know, people put down. So I do think people are working on it more, like as we said, in terms of self-awareness and being stable and on, on being vulnerable hundred percent. But now again, like what, what, what my friends today said with, uh, from, from Brazil, it was amazing because this is what it is about. Like, okay, this is happening there, but for example, it's not happening directly around you. What is your circle of impact, right? And what, and what, and what do you see? So how can I still, you know, acknowledge that, get the information out of it, but still be stable and be inspired to make this, you know, um, you know, to, to create out, the, out of the energy that is coming from intention and, and calmness to actually deal with this chaos out, outside, right? The story says it's not letting it kill you, not letting, letting exactly. it affect you to the point of hurting. Uh, but uh, by keeping the separation, this is art. We're, we're, you know, we're animals that react to our environment, and uh, and that's your environment over there. And and and, but you can't let it overwhelm it, overwhelm you. So, yeah. I'm sorry, Jose, you were going to say. Something. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that we're reaching the top of the hour, or we've just passed. And I uh, was wondering, we have a new guest uh, today that is not a regular wondering if Andy would like to uh, say anything uh, before we, we close things up in a minute. Yeah, thanks, Jose. It's been uh, great to be along for the ride and listen to uh, everything. Tina and I have known each other for a little while now and have yeah. kept in touch with each other and supported each other. So it's been good to hear a little more from her, but also to get insights from all of you. Um, I think the, uh, you know, diversification of, uh, you know, control and contribution that you outlined earlier, rather than just having, uh, you know, the one dictator type approach is really interesting. Um, how you do that across a large organization, I think would be uh, technically uh, interesting, but that's for another time. Um, I think another thing is that everyone on this call has got a degree of um, self-actualization and in touch with themselves but there's a whole bunch of people on this planet who don't necessarily have that 
and uh, you know how do we include them and bring them along on the journey is uh, is an interesting uh, dilemma but um yeah it's been it's been great i really appreciate the time to have been here and to have uh, listened to your insights and wisdom and uh, look forward to more in the future so thank thank you very much welcome thank you for back. joining us i thank everybody for all the questions and with that we're done terrific <laughs> and thank you guys thank you Thank so you. nice you meeting you all yeah. and so nice seeing you andy again yeah. andy <laughs> andy the, all the ball guys welcome you <laughs> good to see yeah, you friends for sure too bye-bye bye-bye